Should I go on? Yeah. Okay, so this is a completely different uh, subject, although we still have acted, of course. <laughs> But uh, so this is my new project at, um, at Ecole Normale Supérieure. And so this is how to um, understand how actin pulls the nucleus through a constriction. So in fact, um, this is, so up to now I have considered the cell as just its cytoskeleton. If you remember in my first drawing, the, the nucleus was a sort of gray thing I didn't talk about. But the uh, question is now how, uh, what does actin do to the nucleus when a cell goes through um, thin constriction? And in fact, it's well known that the nucleus is uh, much stiffer than the rest of the cell. So when a cell needs to go through a constriction, um, the nucleus is sort of the limiting, um, uh, limiting organelle. And we want to understand how actin has a role here in maybe pulling the nucleus through this constriction. So what we know about the link uh, between the nucleus and the, the extracellular matrix is here. So, you know, inside the nucleus here, we have the chromatin and here we have a shell. I mean, it's again, an elastic shell, it, a shell of lamin just underneath the nuclear, uh, nuclear envelope here. And, um, then we have, act, so actin is linked by, let's say a link, it's, it's called a link complex, a link, there's a link between actin and the lamin, let's say. So here you have this shell, elastic shell just underneath the, um, the bimembrane of, of the nucleus. And this elastic shell is linked to actin. So we wondered how, uh, actin forces could change something inside the nucleus. So what we did was uh, go to um, um, a system that was de developed in the Lamerding lab. Um, so here you have lamin um, that is marked in green. So lamin is this protein here, this, net, this shell underneath the, the nucleus uh, bimembrane. And so if you mark the nucleus, you can, you can see how the nucleus behaves when, it, when the cell goes through small spaces. So here you have a microfluidic system. You put the cells on the left and you make them move just by the, the ability to move. So you see here, the cell is around this nucleus. Here you see another nucleus that's green and you see the cell around it. So I'll show the movie. And you see that the nucleus is squeezed here. Uh, and you can see that it's an elastic um, um, shell because you have some wrinkling here too. I will come back to that later. So the question is um, now what about the, the actin? So now we can do something else. We can um, measure nuclear stiffness with these uh, micropipettes in parallel. Oops. So if I show you the movie here, so we can aspirate the, the cell. So here it's DAPI, the nucleus is marked with DAPI. We can aspirate the cells, I mean, their nuclei and see how, how fast they go. We can derive the nuclear stiffness. So in fact, we, uh, we did that with, uh, with uh, some cells. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that now. So again, we have the lamins here. What we do is we mark the lamins. We mark the end of this nest print here, this um, link that links the actin to the lamin is a very, very long protein. It's a very um, heavy protein. It's about uh, 350 nanometers once it's uh, is stretched. So we could, uh, again, mark the, the both ends of, of this link. Um, and so what we, what we saw was uh, if we put our um, cells in a migrating device, we see that nest spring, so this um, fluorophore here, appears at the front of the nucleus, which means that whereas nest springs are distributed all around the nucleus before you put them in, a, in this device, during the motility, nest springs go to the front. And if we do the same experiment now, but uh, I mean, if we do the, the, what I call the passive experiment, if we want to measure the rheology of these um, nuclei, 
What we see is that um, Nesprin doesn't go at the front of the aspiration. So in fact, Nesprin is enriched at the front in an active actin dependent process. So the, the cell is active, the experimenter is inactive. Whereas here, the cell is passive and the experimenter is active. So this is what I call an active mechanism. And this is what I call a, a, a passive mechanism. So the question is, what can we do about this? I mean, how is acting, how is it pulling? And what's the link between what's um, underneath? So in fact, one uh, very important um, um, result is that nest prints um, are distributed at the front of the nucleus, whereas lamins remain evenly distributed, as you see here. So in fact, if you see, there is a slight increase of fluorescence here on the sides, and we think it's some wrinkling again. So we see wrinkling of the, of the lamin shell, as you can see here on the, um, so th these are spinning disc, disc images. Um, so here is the nucleus. If you cut here, you see here some wrinkling of the nesprin and some wrinkling of the lamin. If you, if you look through here, you still see some wrinkling, whereas here you see no wrinkling at all. So this again, so we haven't um, quantified this yet, but this again indicates that there is some elasticity in the nesprin and in the uh, lamin shells. Right, so in fact, we characterized um, how actin pulls on this nucleus by this experiment here, uh, consisting in ablating um, the cytoskeleton uh, during um, cell uh, passage. So here is a cell, the uh, cytoskeleton is schematized in purple, the nucleus is green. And so the question is what happens on this movement when we cut at the back, at the front, or at the cell front. So here you have the um, recoil of the cell. So what happens is that if we cut at the back, there is no movement of the cell. The cell will continue to, to, to go, or I mean, at least it will not go back. If we, if we cut here at the front, we have a recoil um, of, of the, so the, the whole nucleus will go backwards. If we cut it at the cell front, we still have a recoil here. So in fact, myosin contracts at the rear, but we, we see no effect here. Um, There's no, um, no effect when, when the nucleus is engaged here in the, in the constriction, that there is no effect of, um, of myosin. Right, so I will go back here to um, active system and where, where uh, where we can sort of get inspired. So just um, to remind you that um, Robert Brown was the first to uh, observe the natural agitation of pollen, uh, pollen particle. And it's interesting to see that this discovery was um, during the discovery of the cell theory that cells were active living systems. And you may remember that Robert Brown and his colleagues so, thought that uh, pollen grains were some active particles. And um, it's interesting to see that uh, physicists needed sort of eight, 80 years to understand that um, this was in fact a passive movement and there's nothing active in pollen particles. And um, in 1908, Langevin proposed this equation um, um, that you know to describe the, um, the movement of these particles just to, to, um, to fix the idea. So I, 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 um, uh, I took two videos of, uh, under my microscope um, of, of beads of um, half a micrometer in diameter here. And um, this is purely passive. Um, um, temperature dependent uh, movement. And um, so these are um, slightly bigger particles and you see that they are not as fast as, as these ones. 
So just to, to remind you, um, this is an example of Brownian um, trajectory, and then we can derive the uh, diffusion coefficient of, of this movement. And this is the order of magnitude of the diffusion for one micron diameter particle in water. So in fact, what we want to do now is go back to this and say, okay, I have seen some active and passive um, behaviors. How can I um, use this equation and sort of extra extract some activity from my experiments? And here we took an inspiration uh, by um, the work of Chase Brodots, where so what he did was uh, use a Langevin equation analysis on a slightly different system where, so he has cells. So this is a purely um, planar system. So it's a, a pattern surface. Um, here you have a surface that is adhesive for cells, uh, but there's no, uh, no constrictions. It's just that you have um, a sort of uh, path here that would allow cells to go from a square to the other. And so they look at the, uh, they take the center of the cell, I mean, the, they take the nucleus as the sort of center of the cell and they follow the movement of the nucleus from one side to the other. So here you see the, um, the trajectories of, of, of some of the nuclei. And, and then they run a Langevin equation um, um, from, from these experiments. And they started to extract some, um, um, uh, so some, some stochastic, um, stochastic contribution and, and uh, force contribution. And we wanted to apply this to our system. So this is very, very preliminary data so we, um, we determined uh, with our, on our experiments on nuclei translocation, we determined the deterministic term here. So this is the deterministic component of this equation as a function of the velocity of the barycenter of the nucleus and the position. And you can see that we can, we can, uh, we can see some uh, amplitude, um, and uh, for example, so this is, sorry, this is the um, uh, size of the constriction. So this corresponds to the, to, the, to the edges of the pillars. And uh, you see that we have a high amplitude of this deterministic component here before it, and before the nucleus enters the constriction and after the nucleus has left the constriction. We see something in between, but for the moment, I wouldn't uh, draw any conclusion on that. So we are now settling our new experiments at the Normal Superior, um, uh, trying to, to, to develop this analysis. So it will take some time, but this is the idea right now. But um, in fact, I wanted to share with you a very, very uh, recent results on, so our idea is that um, then we want to see um, so if I go back to here, then we want to see how this would change the chromatin distribution inside. So we would like to, uh, with this um, Langevin equation, would like to measure, uh, as I say here, extract the um, um, deterministic and stochastic uh, contributions um, as a function of uh, position and velocity, but also the polarization vector, uh, because um, as you remember, we have nest spring polarizing uh, on one side and also the chromatin distribution. And I will show you our first results on chromatin distribution. So um, here you see a nucleus that goes through this constriction. So here you see the uh, nest spring, so that actin is now pulling on, on the left. And you see that chromatin, the density of chromatin changes. You see that there is a sort of hole at the, at the uh, front of the nucleus where it pulls. And, and here, so we see that the distribution of chromatin varies when the, when the cell goes through the constriction. We are now trying to, to measure it, to quantify it. And if you look at this one, you see also some wrinkling of the nest spring here. So you see that, um, so we both have this wrinkling and, and 
So yet we don't know what will um, change the chromatin distribution inside. So we want to, to see how all that um, coordinates. Right, so I will stop here. This is really ongoing experiments and it's not easy to do these experiments in the middle of the uh, confinement, the COVID story and, um, and moving labs, but um, uh, we hope we'll have soon more results. And so the take home message is that actin pulls the nucleus through constrictions. So it's actin that does pull the nucleus through constriction. And, um, and we can develop a quantitative analysis of this active mechanism as a, so to see how chromatin and nesprins and lamins uh, behave. Right, so I will stop here and thank the people who started this work with me, uh, Patricia Davidson, um, Anan El Mansouri, Cyril Améry, and Sofiane Mora, who is the one who started the um, analysis, the Langevin analysis on our experiments during the lockdown. That was very, very, I mean, enthusiastic. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Cecil, again. Um, so already several questions. Um, so maybe I start um, with this. I noticed, you know, a slide five, the uh, fluoride as an aspirin signal. Uh, look to me, um, they prefer to stay on this flat region. Is there a curvature dependence on distribution? Um, uh, sorry, uh, was it was it a, a, a written question or? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I asked this. So I, I looked at your slide five. And I, I noticed this fluorescent signal as an aspirin. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe I'll take my slide five. Yeah. So it looks to me, uh, the signal uh, has concentrated on this on the flat region. So I wonder if there's a curvature dependent. It's higher at the on the flat region? Yeah. This is what you say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for the next spring, um, not that much, but for the lemon. Uh, yeah, lemon, right, right. And uh, so we think we think it's wrinkling. It's, oh, okay. We add so because instead of looking at one slice, I mean one, you see, instead of looking at something straight, you you look at something wrinkled. So the fluorescence increases. Okay. You understand? Uh, well, I will discuss with you later about that. Um, so maybe I, uh, because there are so many uh, questions uh, accumulate to ask. Yeah. So I uh, want to ask you: uh, Do these cells have a, a perinuclear acting cap? An acting cap on top of the nucleus. Perinuclear. Uh, what do you mean? I I, I don't know. So I know, Wanda, so can you ask? yeah, I can unmute. <laughs> no, yeah. I was just asking, I guess, about the distribution of actin surrounding the nucleus. If you have a sense of that, so just that you believe there's this more actin. On yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Front? So yeah, I don't have. I didn't prepare the slide here, but in fact, yeah, we mark the actin, and we can see some fibers. Um, or, or, or on, in a cylinder around the constrictions. And that, I mean, the surprise that was that there is not more actin appearing at the front of the nucleus than, a, than anywhere else. So we don't know. So we were thinking that the centrosome may, may sort of hide the actin at the front of the nucleus, but we are still looking at this. Thank you. Okay, so then Catherine asks, uh, nasperins expressed at the constant level and migrate towards the front of the cell, or are they expressed at a higher level prior to active, uh, active motility? So what, um, so I didn't get this. Oh, so she uh, asked, uh, a nasperin expression level, are they keep constant? Or actually okay, so we, we checked, okay, we checked that, all right, so we checked that, um, Nesprin, that what we were seeing was not dependent on the uh, expression of Nesprin. So we blocked the expression. And uh, we did, we, we, we saw the same um, um, distribution uh, at the front. So it doesn't depend on the expression of Nesprin. If this was the question. Uh, Catherine, does that answer the question? Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. And then Adria asks, uh, is there evidence that uh, eliminates any role of nuclear lamina in the constriction of the nuclear independence? Uh, 
of actin nesprin? If not, could the nuclear lamina also have an independent role in nuclear constriction? Okay, this is this one. Is there evidence that eliminates any role in the constriction of the nucleus? Um, so I think, but I think the lamina is um, passive. So yeah, I think it could have, so the slide is still here. It could have an effect on the wrinkling, I think. It could help the wrinkling. And we don't know yet how the nesprins are, if they are um, sort of shell or if they are independent uh, springs. But I think, I think uh, Talila Folk uh, showed quite nicely that it's a sort of uh, shell, elastic shell. So, I would expect the lamina play a role of a passive elastic shell, but um, I'm happy to hear otherwise if I'm not aware. Okay. So Eric asked you, uh, your ablation experiment nicely shows that something is pulling on the nucleus from the front. Uh, what is the evidence that's acting? Okay. Um, we put some drugs that, um, um, affect the actin and um, it doesn't work anymore. So, and uh, if we put drugs that destroy the microtubules, it still works. Mm. So, what, could, what, what else could it be? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm sure actin is generating the force, but I guess it's not obvious that it's the linkage that's act the, the, the thing that's. Yeah, was All right, so we, we used um, another linkage. Uh, we used um, a dominant negative of, of Nesprin that doesn't bind to actin, and we didn't have this. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks. And I didn't mention um, that, in fact, if we look at um, large avenues instead of going through constrictions, there is no accumulation of Nesprin at the front. I guess I was wondering about the possibility of a combination of actin and intermediate filaments, right? Because intermediate filaments also go into the new, I mean, different types of intermediate filaments, of yeah, course. Yeah, you are right. So there are a few new publications on, on this. So intermediate filaments may be uh, involved here. Yeah. Thank you. So we took the sort of, uh, because we know actin and we know actin has a role, we sort of took this uh, point of view, but you are right that we should look at uh, intermediate filaments for sure. Thank you. Good. So let's see, uh, Rafael asked, uh, uh, he says, thanks for a great talk. What caused the nuclear to want to go through the constriction? <laughs> oh, so I should have said that it's the, in fact, it's it's actin. So here on this slide, there's, mm. there's actin. Ad, 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 so the cell adheres on the surface, uh, just like the um, three-step motility I showed you, uh, the scheme of three-step motility. So you, you have to imagine this, the cell, the membrane of the cell sticking to the substrate and actin polymerization, um, pushing the membrane forward. And then, then this is what, what pulls, the, what, what makes the cell move first. And then the second effect is that the actin pulls on, on the nesprin. But there is some actin dynamics going on at the front of the cell. <laughs> and this is what um, Chase Brodets is looking at. I mean, has been looking at is how the lamellipodium changes shape and all that. But we are more interested into, I mean, we are more focused on, on what happens um, on the link between the nucleus and the actin. Uh, Robin has a comment. Uh, when red blood cells squeeze through capillaries, they also winkle. Yeah, I expect so. Yeah, here to remind me another thing. I remember uh, several years ago, my former colleague Shang San and Don Hopkins, they have a, a paper say, when cancer cells squeeze along a narrow region, they use a water pump for them to, to push. So. I wonder if there, in this context, there any relation. All right, so we didn't, we, so yeah, we looked at the volume of the nucleus and mm. the volume doesn't change, but we need to look into that more 
Mm. Um, and we haven't, we haven't, I don't think we have destroyed the pumps. Uh, we haven't looked at the, this activity yet. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Um, I don't see any uh, uh, more questions in the box, but there are a question on your first part. I think people, you can just mute uh, and ask. Miming, I know you have a question. Um, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, I, I thought the stretching is uh, uh, important because, uh, so Grima had asked this question because in vivo in cell migration, uh, acting is uh, always pulling, um, let's say, in, uh, in 3D ECM. That's the sort of experiments we do in the lab quite often. So, uh, so the question of uh, how acting behave in tension uh, would be highly relevant to, to uh, 3D experiments. I, I wonder if you have plans to, uh, to explore that. OK, so not in vitro. Um, I, don't, I won't uh, continue to do these in, in vitro experiments, but what we did was uh, grow um, a cylinder of actin around a membrane tube and pull on it. Mm -hmm. And the paper in Science Advances, I didn't show it here. And this is how we collaborated with Martin Lenz on these simulations. And we can see that depending on, so we stretch the, the sleeve, we call it a sleeve. So we have an actin sleeve. If we, if we pull on it, we see that depending on the number of mesh sizes, either we have a purely elastic system or we have a sort of viscous system. And the number of mesh sizes is very low. In fact, it's, if I remember well, it's uh, between three and five, you see? So if we have five mesh sizes of thickness, of the sleeve, we, it's still elastic. But it's if it's below five, uh, if we pull on it, it just extends. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really fascinating. I actually have a second question, and Jinghua, you'll probably regret to mention my question. <laughs> uh, so we, were, <laughs> we were actually discussing about, you know, during cell migration, this uh, uh, traditional thinking of uh, acting pulls the cell and ectomycin contract the cell, and that's sort of a, a necessary step for cell migration. So in your experiment, it looks like to squeeze through the con constriction, ectomycin is not necessary. Is that sort of a contradicted to the traditional way of thinking how cell migrates, or should we rethink about um, cell migrating okay. the traditional way of cell migrating? Okay, so um, what I think from what I've read is cell migrates with these three, three steps, but they adapt the steps. So it, depending on the conditions, you would have more actin that polymerizes at the front, that would be the pulling force, or more, more contraction at the, at, at, at the rear that would squeeze the cell forward. And um, um, I remember, so I don't have the reference in mind, but I remember some experiments in um, thin cylinders, thin uh, cylinders where, where you, uh, so if you increase the diameter of the cylinder, then you activate more actin polarization forces. Whereas if you decrease the size of the squeezing path, um, you increase the activity of myosin. So I guess the cell has the capacity to adapt to the geometry of where it goes, um, either with the, the um, contraction or with the polymerization forces. That's but in our setup, Mm -hmm. um, we are, it seems that we're more sensitive to actin polymerization. And when we kill the myosin, we still see the, the cell um, um, translocating. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So there is a, a likelihood that in 2D and 3D, the, uh, or even within 3D, the different matrix stiffness might modulate. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. You know, and you know, the, you have this amyboid motility versus um, 
uh, amoeboid versus uh, and kind of. ability. And uh, so I guess the cell has different ways of, of doing that. And we hope to be able to see if, so the idea in our experiments is to see how chromatin is, uh, how chromatin distribution is different in, in the same experiment, in the same in vitro experiments, but in cells that have, um, that have um, gone to the epithelial mesenchymal transition. So we'd like to see, is it in chromatin that, that we have more uh, myosin that's expressed? I mean, this is the idea to compare the both um, ways of motility. Yeah, looking for 